Hello there. Okay. Welcome, everyone. How you doing? This is Jonathan Lip here from the Big Apple Film Festival. And this is our final panel on distribution. This is our distribution summit that took place this week. And today is our final panel. And we're focusing on licensing, licensing content to streaming platforms and TV networks. So we have with us today, we have Sal Scamardo from FilmRise. We have Josh Nadler from Affirm Films at Sony Pictures. And we have sales agent Gary Rubin. Thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. So I'm going to ask each of you, and then we're going to jump into the questions to introduce yourself. So uh, why don't we start with Sal? Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Yes, Sal Scamardo with FilmRise, uh, Vice President of Marketing and Distribution for the company. And I oversee all of our new release uh, film marketing, as well as our streaming platforms and uh, on all, <laughs> every, every type of platform. So Ava, Tiva, Esva, all across the board. All right. Thank you. And Josh? Hi, uh, Director of Development for Sony Affirm, and I oversee development and acquisitions for the division, and we do theatrical, and we have a streaming service called PureFlix as well. Okay, cool. And uh, Gary, hello. Hi, I'm Gary Rubin. Um, I have 25 years in acquisitions and distribution. I recently hung up a sales agent shingle, um, handled a film out of Telluride that Jill sold re recently. And uh, I had the pleasure of speaking to some of your uh, participants uh, not too long ago, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And uh, happy to be here today. Cool. All right. Thank you, Gary. All right. So uh, anyone, if they want to ask any questions regarding distribution, licensing your, your film to net, net, TV networks or streaming platforms, or tell us a bit about your project, feel free to put it into the Q&A box or into the chat box. Uh, but first, let me begin by asking Sal, um, if a uh, filmmaker has a film uh, that they would like to try to present to you, uh, what is it that FilmRise looks for in an independent film when determining what to acquire? Well, I mean, you know, uh, that changes uh, all the time, but generally, you know, I would say we're looking for something that's going to fit our model. Um, we look at every film individually in terms of what it brings to the table. Uh, sometimes they check off certain boxes that we might be looking for from a content point of view, subject matter, um, uh, obviously marketability, uh, ability to, uh, we analyze the, the social a footprint that the film might bring, whether it's the director or the stars or just the subject matter itself. It could be an issue oriented uh, documentary that may come, maybe comes with uh, quite a bit uh, or it could just be a star driven vehicle uh, and a great uh, script and, and we enjoyed it out of a festival. So uh, it's a mixed bag. Um, I think we try, to, we try to offer quality films that we feel we can be successful with um, knowing who are our downstream customers may be in terms of licensing them, whether uh, it has potential for a streaming platform or maybe another avenue, or maybe it might be a good fit for our own channels, um, which we will look at that kind of monetization opportunities. And um, we look at some of the analytics also on, on terms of um, what, what, uh, what that might be telling us uh, the market is, uh, is, is prime for. So okay. a bunch, bunch of factors basically. All right, thanks. And Josh, what about over at uh, Firm Films and Sony? How do you, uh, is there anything in particular you look for? Well, we do, yeah. We're obviously looking for uh, features that kind of have like a faith-friendly as uh, aspect to it, right? So for us, uh, licensing, for, for pu the PureFlix streaming service, they, you know, they're always licensing um, uh, a product that can fit their their platform, which is a lot of their subscribers are, are kind of on the conservative side. And so nothing that would uh, offend anybody. It's pretty, pretty clean content. And then for us on the, on the feature side, we are more on the development and acquisition. So when we look for something, um, whether to develop or acquire a finished film, we are, um, acquiring it for usually a theatrical release, a pretty wide release. So it has to feel competitive in the market. Um, it has to feel like the kind of movie that if you saw a trailer for it online, you would go, okay, I could see that 
coming out on 2000 screens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so th those are sort of, we're sort of on two ends of the spectrum, sort of the wide theatrical and as far as licensing or developing content, producing content for the streaming service, sort of the lower budgeted um, uh, side as well. Okay, thank you. And Gary, so for, for you, so you're a sales agent representing filmmakers. Uh, what do you look for uh, for a, a filmmaker is currently seeking representation? Well, it is a nasty, in my opinion, nasty market um, in terms of the streaming and pay TV side of it. And, uh, you know, you're at a situation where if you have what a Netflix or whomever wants, they'll pay, you know, an endless number, infinity for it. But if you don't have what they want, it's, it could be a zero. And uh, that's, I've been doing this a long time. That's, this is really the first time I can remember that. So I'm extremely selective in what I handle because of that. Right, understandable. All right, let me, uh, we have a bunch of questions. Let me just jump into these. Uh, first, um, we have a question uh, Cricket had asked, is asking this, and I believe this question was asked actually in the last panel. We didn't get to it, sorry about that. So let's get to it now. Can you talk about deliverables? Uh, what do filmmakers need to deliver to distributors and streaming networks? Um, and then what are some common issues like that you don't may not necessarily receive that you, you would need from them? Um, yeah, so the deliverables. So Sal, what, if somebody's going out to the film rise platform, what would they need? Sure, yeah, I mean, there's a pretty set set of deliverables that, that come with any kind of agreement, whether you're picking it up for streaming or for a theatrical or whatever type of release. So uh, typically, I mean, I would say a, a pro res of the film, you need to be able to deliver that uh, in addition to the legal documents that support documents that come um, with, with that property. So uh, clearances, particularly music clearances, any any kind of licensing, uh, copies of, of uh, releases, things of that nature. So you need to be buttoned up and prepared for that. A lot of filmmakers kind of get snagged, especially first time filmmakers in the, in the deliverable part and might need a little extra assistance uh, with that. So we try to work with people uh, on that, but we're very clear from the very beginning when we start negotiating that that's what the expectation is. So it's a, basically a checklist of, of uh, you know, E&O insurance, uh, you know, all of those things that we want to make sure that we have the, the rights to distribute uh, free and clear uh, that property. Okay. And Josh, you have a streaming network as, as well. What do you require for, for your network? Um, <clears throat> well, Sal, Sal definitely covered uh, all of it. <laughs> I think for us, like, you know, when, when, when we're talking about licensing something that's been out there already, everything should, should have been buttoned up, right? So like, if they're coming to the streaming service for a licensing deal, um, assuming that project was out there in some way before, and you're just sort of uh, exploiting another window, right? It's, it's, there's not, you know, this isn't really the payday. Like you, in terms of like um, finished content, uh, you know, you want to, you want to sort of look for a platform or a studio that, or just distributor, it's going to, um, you know, if, if it's your first run, you know, pick it up more as an acquisition than licensing. Um, so yeah, to, to the independent filmmakers, definitely like m making sure you're talking to someone or having someone on your team that is, um, you know, just, where everyone is clear on on what you're going to need you know not not having some needle drop of a song that you don't have the rights to or something like that you know just everything has to be cleared <laughs> yeah but yeah and if, if it's if it's a licensing deal then usually usually everything's sort of like button up at that point okay now um, Brian is asking, uh, so it's a two-part question. Um, so Sal, I'm going to ask you the first half and then Gary's the second half. Um, so it says, who are the best distributors to work with for documentary films to get them onto streaming services? And then the second part of the question is, do you recommend a sales agent to negotiate the market? So Sal, can you take the first Oh, wow. I, I don't know if I want to single out any, anyone in particular. I mean, I think if I can answer that generically, I think the best distributors for documentary films and I've worked in that space a lot um, and, and we love working on them and I love working on them personally, uh, are the, the uh, companies that show a passion for the subject matter, 
and can really think out of the box. It's very challenging uh, to, to market documentaries, but it can also be extremely rewarding. Um, you can be dealing with, you know, you really need to immerse yourself in the subject matter and get to know the world almost as well as the filmmaker who's been living with that subject in many cases for years uh, and have built up a lot of relationships. So without kind of naming names, I think it's important for the filmmakers to really feel out whoever they're talking to, including uh, sales agents, by the way, and there are certain sales agents that are great at, at, uh, at the do in the documentary category and they're kind of known for that. I think we know who they are, um, that, that have that passion for those projects because it, it takes a lot of TLC to kind of get those off the ground and a lot of patience. So. All right, thank you. And Gary, the other part was, do you recommend a sales agent to negotiate the market? Any particular one you mean, or just in general? Uh, sales agents in general. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, uh, you should not try to sell your own film. Uh, you need someone to represent you, whether it's a sales agent or possibly a lawyer or an agent. Um, you, uh, I'm sure these gentlemen will back me up on this. Uh, what submissions come in uh, without representation, they're often returned. Uh, yeah. You need somebody selling your phone for you. Yeah. Um, and also, um, Kim, again, for Gary, Kim, Kim asked upon content and post, how do we develop a relationship with dozen of fil dozens of films that are complete and will take you into pre-production? Um, wait, I'm not sure if I get that. Hold on. Upon con, sorry, I don't think I understood that question. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm going to come back to that. Uh, all right, Rick asked, as a creator, but not a writer, uh, where do I fit into the food chain? What should be my expectations as I proceed with my finished pilot? Um, any any thoughts on that from anyone? Anyone want to jump in there? Uh, <laughs> I I'm not sure. Like, so is he asking? Uh, is is it a shot pilot or did he just wrote a script? That's uh, what you mean. I, I guess he has a a finished pilot, but he's not. I guess not the writer yeah got it um okay yeah th that's that's an interesting place to be you know there are there are filmmakers that will sometimes like what we call shoot a spec pilot yeah um but usually and you know I, i'm not on the tv side but from from what i know from from the, my tv executive that i work with um you know, they're not looking for finished pilots. They're looking for ideas um, with with sort of established creators. What we call like them showrunners is another right. word for it. And and then the that executive, that TV executive, will go out with what we call a package to the networks. To you know, like networks now like include the Netflixes as well as yeah. well as you know like ABC and all that. But like. So I, I'm not sure like what, what, to, what to say to someone that has a finished pilot because mm. uh, I'm not quite sure who's, who's looking for something that's been shot in the, in the TV realm. Okay. That makes sense. Uh, yeah, okay. I would agree with that. Just, uh, you know, I think it's, it is important who you bring to the table um, if you're gonna do that. So if it's shot by a reputable company that's done other television, that's different if you're a first timer probably not a good idea, uh, but, but it is all about kind of who you're bringing like a showrunner or someone to deliver that show. So in addition to it being a good concept that we're interested in. Okay. Um, and then Gary, um, Candace asked if your film wins festivals like Sundance, do you still need a sales agent? You do, maybe even more. Because <laughs> yeah. if you win Sundance, you're up for a big payday more than likely, but it's gotta be handled skillfully. And so you need somebody who, who has all the connections. So um, yes, the answer is absolutely. I would imagine most Sundance winners probably have a sales agent or a producer's rep. They probably do. Okay. Yeah. You, you want to go into the festival with a sales agent attached. Right. Uh, and, and then there was a question, what does the typical, typical agreement entail in procuring a sales agent? Is there... Is, He's asking like between three and 6% uh, commission. How does it work? Is there a typical? Uh, well, that 
three and six percent is fluid. Uh, it can be. It certainly can be higher than that. But it dep depends on uh, how strong the project is. Quite frankly, I think if you have a, a big film with a lot of cast, you know, um, people are more likely to work for five percent. Uh, other than that, it may be more of a, a ten percent kind of situation. Uh, what else are you, was she asking about? Sorry. Um, let's see. It was uh, what is the typical agreement for procuring a sales agent? Um, real estate commissions are negotiable, but typical fall within three to six percent. Oh, 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 I see. Making a comparison. <laughs> making, I see. Making a comparison. Yeah. Right. Uh, what's the standard, if any? Yeah. Um, right. Got it. Okay. Um, all right. Then hold on one second. Uh, let me jump over to the chat box. Uh, Joanna said, I, my film had a PBS premiere last spring, but I own all my rights other than educational because I turned the film's impact campaign into a nonprofit. We have a huge reach and still big momentum, including 12,000 followers. Now I would like to find a sales agent to sell to streamers, but do you think it's harder for me at this point? I don't know. I, I would ask, uh, how extensive was that PBS premiere? Was it just one play or was it on for a while or it depends what the exposure is yes okay so it depends I mean, okay. assuming assuming it's like one one broadcast and maybe a repeat and i know pbs has uh, retained some streaming windows um there still is value for that i've worked with pbs on, on wraparound rights where they take the broadcast and I mean, we'll take all other rights for streaming or other platforms, including transactional and DVD. I mean, it just depends on the deal, uh, but that's a good point. You know, what's the exposure for the film? Obviously, I love the fact that that, that this person has accumulated a, a nice a base of followers um, for the film. I think that's important. Uh, you can, you can uh, leverage that. Uh, for sure, um, there's your army of people to talk about the film and, and do impact, the impact campaign is, obviously really important uh, to do. So there's still life for the film. So I would say there's probably a distributor that would pick it up again. I don't know the subject or what the, what, what, what the, uh, the particulars of that film are, but um, you know, definitely worth a, a shot. Okay. And then Andrew asks, and, the, and by the way, the last, the last part of this question, I think is the most important generally for everyone. Um, it says, he says, first, is there an opportunity for distribution for an R-rated comedy that has won awards at, at 10 feature, uh, at 10 features so far this year? I mean, I think that means at 10 festivals. Um, funny and well-liked, but has known, no known cast. And I think that's the most important part because I think most of the people on here probably have films where they, they may not necessarily have very well-known cast. So uh, yeah, what are the opportunities for distribution if you do not have a known cast? Um, so Josh, you want to start with that? Well, sure. I mean, you know, you, you could, we, you know, as consumers, we could all kind of turn on our home screen and go to any streaming platform and see a lot of movies being presented um, that you could kind of scroll through <laughs> that don't have known casts. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I think the question is, I think, I think another question to ask yourself when you're making a movie is that like, are you making a movie at a budget level uh, that is low enough to where uh, w you could work, you know, you could kind of license it or sell it to a streaming service or a platform distributor, or what have you, that is, might, might not like give you a lot of money for it. Uh, because you don't have known cast. So it's like, it's not so much, can you get it out there? I think like, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is, there's, there's sort of an infinite amount of space to get content out there um, on, on these platforms. It's more about getting your money back on, on the production costs. <laughs> um, and that's the harder thing to do. And, and so if, um, if your costs, if your production costs are low enough, you, you might be able to squeeze squeeze blood out of the rock you know in terms of like selling it uh internationally you know to all the territories as well as domestically but you might not get the big paydays that sort of bigger movies with with known cast usually get out the gate 
Right. And what, what about Sal? Do you ever look at films at Film Rise that do not have any known actors? Oh, no, sure. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times are there, are they maybe up and coming or breakthrough? But I think we look at the reviews, if there are any up from a festival, so if it's a unique, uh, like in this case, a comedy, we love that. Um, if it's a well-told story and uh, we feel like we have, but that's a great point, you know, for the filmmaker, from the filmmaker's point of view, like, you know, what did they spend on the film and be realistic about the expectations. But, you know, we always try to shoot to create um, buzz around anything that we pick up and embrace. So I don't, we would never pick something up and just throw it out there. Um, that's not what we do with our new releases. We really have to believe in them. So we'll give it our all, but, you know, there's no guarantee uh, that it's going to connect, but, you know, uh, sure. We'll take a look at them. I think, you know, festivals are important for that. So it sounds like this person has, gotten some some traction at which festivals, what are they saying? Um, is the story unique? Is it some different twist on, on a story? We'd have to look at all of those things and see if we could do something with it. Okay. Um, yeah. And Gary, can I, uh, you can you I jump in on that? Yeah. Uh, I just want to mention there's something called Amazon Prime Video Direct, I believe is what it's called. Mm -hmm. And basically anybody, you know, yeah, you know, at the standard deal, anybody, anybody can get their product up uh, into an SVOD situation. Now it's up to you to do some marketing so people know it's there and you can derive some revenue, but it's at least up there. And uh, if you're not getting the distribution you want, you can go into a self-distribution mode and that's, that's one way to do it. Uh, of course, there's other windows as well, but that's a primary one. Um, and also, Gary, do you rep films if they don't have name actors in them? Depends how good it is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I yeah I agree. Yeah. Right. Uh, if it's if it's really outstanding, yes. Otherwise, I'm very very cautious. Yeah. You need some kind of you know minimal social media. So I mean, you could have an unknown, maybe a first time perform but it has a, a social media following or is built up in a different area maybe mm -hmm. they're you know transition to movies they may be an influencer or something that uh, that helps so you have to kind of look at all of those things and see if you can you know um, make something out of it you know so okay. it's helpful to have that all right and um and joanna um the regarding the pbs project uh, there was no streaming rights with pbs and only showed last spring nothing beyond okay. that so uh Okay, uh, when negotiating back end points with crew members, is that something that could potentially change when the film is sold or can those contracts be drafted beforehand? I don't know if that's something that would go- That's, that's gotta be done way, way in advance of the sale. That's the first thing you do when you're assembling the financing uh, hmm. is that's part of that process. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, Rick said um, he has an award-winning original TV series pilot with at least three seasons broken down in the Bible. What's the next step? Anyone, any thoughts on this? An award-winning TV series pilot with at least three seasons broken down. What uh, I, is next I, step? Assume, I assume the award was at a festival or, or some, yeah. I'm like, assuming, yeah. Right. Uh, I mean, I prefer to kind of package it up, see if there are production companies that are that are in that space that might be interested in in picking that up and packaging it with a showrunner or something and then presenting it mm -hmm. there, especially if it, it sounds like it has some promise mm -hmm. um, that's kind of thought through. So that's always a good thing and to get a proper pitch deck and everything together to present that. But I think it's really important to have a great, in my opinion, to have a partner and a production team. There are producers, of production companies out there looking for that. Um, so that might be one way. And Sal, I, I don't, I don't believe Film Rise gets involved with the production end of things. But um, Rick said um, he was a finalist in the Big Apple Film Festival in the script competition. What would be his next step to leverage this win? Any options now? We're da kind of dabbling in the production side, but more co-production. So we like working with established production companies for a lot of the reasons that we've just mm -hmm. kind of outlined here. So, cause we know what we're going to get, we know what we're buying and we know we have good people that are going to deliver. Again, mm -hmm. the delivery is really important, especially with streaming platforms. You gotta, it's gotta be correct. It's gotta be on time, all that. So that's why a production company is really important to have on a series in particular and just run it properly. Um, so yeah. 
Uh, you know, Josh, what about for you? I mean, uh, firm films, I don't know if you're involved with production, but if somebody has a, is a finalist or a winner of a script competition, does it, is there anything, any uh, advice you can give to help them leverage that? Sure. I mean, you know, like if, if you're not, if you don't live in Los Angeles and New York, I mean, I think a, a good step is to, is to sort of be a part of competitions that are being looked at by people in the industry. Um, and I would, I would just continue to, I think, research and find out which competitions are, are really being looked at by, by industry people. And, um, a, you know, a, I think, it, uh, you know, trying to find a manager or an agent is, is a, I think, a, another part of this, especially if you live outside of LA and you're not just, you know, meeting people in the industry all the time. Um, so yeah, I, I think just continuing on and and surrounding yourself with a community of people that will help kind of speak into your your material to make it better. Hopefully, you're doing that to your your friends' scripts as well, and and eventually you'll you'll find yourself um, you know maybe connecting with an agency or a manager, and and they'll they'll, they'll find interest in your voice, and 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 then. From there, like you'll you'll start to figure out what the game plan is for you because, um, the you know the thing about for us we're we're not really looking we're we're not in need of material per se or ideas or, or scripts what we're, what we need are are um our IP and stories make sense for us as a studio to to start developing um. So when I look at scripts, it's usually because um, they uh, it's through a producer or an agency that has vetted it and maybe even have has developed the script a bit and and it might come with some more attachments or something. But there's something about it that's a bit more turnkey. You know, I, I'm not out there connecting with with the um, with the competitions. Uh, it's just it's, it's just not the kind of stuff we're, we're specifically looking for, you know? Okay. Um, yeah. And Gary, um, Jesse asked if you look at rough cuts in your decision-making pro process or do you- Absolutely, I do. 100%. You do? Okay. okay. I'm never sure that's a good idea always though. So <laughs> I, throw, I throw a caution sign on the maybe, rough maybe, cut. Yeah. He, he's right. Maybe fine cut is a better word. Fine cut, yeah. Because that can really just- destroy any momentum that you're <laughs> it burns a, it burns an opportunity if it's not well done right yeah i think it's about putting your best foot forward whatever whatever that means for the project so if you have a project that is you know needs some kind of like special effects and and instead of doing the work to get the special effects in you have like a placeholder say trust me you're gonna love this once it's finished it's it's uh you want to get as close to like presentable i think is is one way of looking at it Okay. I think it's also different. These guys, because uh, I've been an actor for many years as well. You, they're absolutely right. You know, be, presenting an unfinished film is, is dangerous territory. For a sales agent, uh, we have to get in as early as possible. So I may have to be a little more risk taking, if you will. Right. Yeah. Um, Sorry, when we when we acquire movies, we're looking to acquire movies, you know, we actually like it that we don't want a locked picture, you know, like if something comes to us, we want to be able to, if we see potential with it, um, we might need to like open it back up and like change some things, you know, just to have it make it work for us. So like, you don't, you don't want to go to the other extreme as well and, and have it, you know, so finished that, you, you know, you're, you're way past opening it or something you can't you won't do it or something okay and there's a question um ching jui said i've made a political doc and have won four awards do i deal with a sales agent and distributor at the same time i don't know gary any thoughts on you, that you uh you need the sales agent to get to the distributor unless the distributor sees it, sees it somewhere and is aware of it uh and tracks you down You'll you'll need the sales agent to to get to the distributor, but if if it's it, it is possible, all all acquisitions people track, they mm -hmm. can find you first. 
Okay. There, there's a lot of questions about how to find a sales agent. Now, I mean, I, when we're done here, I mean, we can provide, you know, your information, um, but just generally speaking, uh, how would someone go about finding a sales agent? Uh, on the film side, there's really only about 15 or 20 of us. It's a pretty, pretty short list. Mm -hmm. uh, starting with the big three agencies. Right. Uh, and there's another, like I say, another 10, 15 after that. So and uh, if a movie submitted to a sales agent, uh, the question is, do you look at it yourself or do others view it first and then let you know if they think it's something you should look at? Talking to me? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, generally I would look at it first. Yes, unless I'm less excited about it, but I want to be sure. But generally, if, I, if I'm interested, I'll look at it myself. Mm -hmm. Um. Let's see. John asked if I've had a film that went straight to streaming, but has se seemed to sell well over the past two to three years. Can you check the numbers on that to better consider my next film for possibility of success? So like, all right. So Sal, for example, somebody has a movie on a platform somewhere, did yeah. well. Will you look at those numbers to decide if you would consider picking up his next film? Well, a, a lot of times those numbers aren't really available to us. So uh, it, it's proprietary information uh, and they're not necessarily sharing it. Um, and unless it's a big blockbuster where you're seeing a chart, you know, uh, you're not going to really know going in. I mean, you can get a sense for it from the press coverage and other ways of scraping data and so on and so forth to see if it's going to work or not. So Got it. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you, Eric? Ar Arlene asks, can you recommend a few production companies that are looking for TV pilots or series? Any, anybody have any suggestions? I, th I think there's, I mean, there's probably a lot. I, I think yeah. something to think about for, for your process might be to um, look up the shows that are similar to the show you have, to the project you have, and see who the producers are, who the production company is. Um, and, and take it from there because they might be looking for something similar or just or just want to live in a specific space that would be similar to the, to the content you you're, you have. Okay, um, there was a there was a question for Sal, but I guess you could probably all weigh in on this. But I'll start with Sal. Um, the question was, uh, you mentioned marketability. How do you define marketability? Oh wow, uh, you know, we kind of have your finger on the pulse of what's happening. So it could be, I mean, you know, on a basic level, it's you know, again, I think I mentioned like having social media, uh, again, star power uh, that comes not necessarily comes with social media because so older stars aren't even on Instagram or any of these platforms. But uh, awareness, a subject matter, um, does it tick off a box that we need? Do we see that there's a, a, a potential for the film in the marketplace, what might be doing well. There's a lot of different factors. Our analytics team might identify, uh, you know, crime uh, films about crime or crime documentaries as a hot uh, seller uh, based on maybe other data that they're getting in or, you know, so there's a lot of different factors that we take into consideration marketability. But I like to look at if I can do a great press campaign on it. A lot of times we don't have big budgets for these films, um, but we want to we want to maximize every lever that we can. So, are there press hooks to it? I will usually let my team screen a film if I think it's got potential, and have them come back to me with ideas on ways to kind of slice and dice uh, any of the PR opportunities for the film. Um, maybe there's something with the director. Maybe there's something with one of the cast members. Um, in addition to the social media stuff, which is so important for us to kind of get the word out with the soldiers out there to, that want to share and, and um, post about stuff. So those are just a couple a couple things I think that are, are top of mind when we look at stuff. And Josh, what about out of firm films and Sony pictures? What, what do you view as marketable, marketability? Yeah, so I think, you know, from, from a studio standpoint, um, you know, we are, we are kind of in the, in the theatrical business still and, uh, that really means the wide theatrical business. So like, you know, there is the specialty release releases every weekend um, where smaller movies uh, might need what we call like a word of mouth. So it's like you watch it and you're like, that was great. Let me tell my friends I should go watch this or, and the Rotten Tomatoes score is high and, and the reviews are great. And so you would, you would take a chance on some weird little movie that 
that is in theaters, right? Um, or or on on premium VOD, and you you spend your you know eight eight ninety nine to rent it for the evening, um, and that could be because of the reviews or the word of mouth or the cast or the genre, right? Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like a wide theatrical release, um, that is sort of the question that studios are the existential question studios are wrestling with. <laughs> Every weekend is is what makes a, a, a theatrical movie, and right. uh, and so what, when we're looking at stuff to develop and produce, we're, we're thinking in terms of, of of those big questions. If you know, if we cast it right, if we execute it right, and develop the story right, um, will you know will people show up enough on opening weekend if, if we put it out on two thousand screens and and you know put the trailer on, you know, during the basketball playoffs enough and all that stuff. So, yeah. um, and I think, a lot yeah, of money, right. Yeah. yeah I, I just, yeah. So like marketability, um, means, you know, it's, it's, it's very important, right. You, you it's like making something is so hard, right. It takes years to get something made, but then you got like, you, you, you need to get, work with a distributor and put it out there. And so, you know, is there an audience for it? Is there, is there, people waiting or would be up for seeing it. And so marketability obviously means something very different when you're opening a movie up against, you know, the, the latest Marvel movie on 2000 screens, mm -hmm. or if you're a smaller movie that um, is, is premiering on, you know, one of the streaming platforms, you know, in premium for eight, eight ninety nine or something, but right. you still, there still needs to be some aspect of marketability to both, both um, avenues. Right. Um, and Allison asks, is it important to build a social media presence before approaching a sales agent? And Jesse said uh, that uh, Jesse has done some marketing in Times Square, billboards and stuff like that. Is that premature before getting a sales agent? So at what, I guess at what point do you go to a sales agent? Should you build your social media presence first? Should you start advertising first or you asking me or yeah 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 gary yeah um i tend to prefer to wait is you can only you, you you can't uh charm the world you know for an infinite amount of time uh i think that the focus should be left to the either the theatrical release or the streaming release uh and uh, I have no problem if a film comes to me with no social media, um, you know, background or whatever. You know, if it's there, it's certainly interesting and you know, you'll see, you know, what the impact could be, uh, but it's not necessary. Okay. Uh, there's a question for Gary and Sal. It said, um, Gary mentioned his company is looking for IP more than anything so they can adjust it. Does he mean a creator would be better to approach him with a unique concept idea for a film or series, meaning a log line versus a completed script? Same question for Sal. That's what it says. I think Josh said that, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> right? Am I right? Probably. probably. <laughs> if, I, if I'm sorry, I got a buzzword like IP, it might have been me. <laughs> oh, okay. Got um, it. Yeah, I, you know, I think on a on a feature length, uh, you know, um, kind of the feature world as, as opposed to the TV world, you want, um, uh, you know, if, if, if you have like sort of an original idea, you, you want to have the script. And if you have um, an IP that means something in the market, um, that's, that's what the, a, a, a production company or just a studio would be interested in is, is the IP. They'll figure out how to how to get this thing developed. Um, that's that's sort of the that's the easy part. The hard part is you know finding the next Twilight or or um, you know or or whatever. But like yeah, so a, a log line doesn't really do it for us if it's if it's an original idea on on the feature side. Okay. Um, and for, oh, yeah, for Sal, uh, Michael wants to know in terms of marketability, uh, has a short film with subject matter that coincides with an upcoming international holiday. 
It takes on this subject from a unique rare angle and we want to find the right home for it. Where do we begin if we want it, it to be on a streaming platform? But it's a, it's a uh -huh. short film. Yeah, shorts present a lot of uh, interesting obstacles. I mean, they're great and, and we recognize their value, but they're hard to monetize on streaming and generally, you know, minimum half an hour um, for a lot of streaming platforms. And, um, you know, we prefer longer or, or having them a uh, number of shorts strung together, like an anthology type, it's, you know, it makes a lot of sense. But a short all by itself doesn't really interest us too much. Um, we pass on a lot of them all the time, unless we, unless it's something that we can blow up into a, maybe potentially into a larger series, you know, with six or eight episodes or something mm -hmm. along those lines. That makes more sense in terms of band. It's a bandwidth issue for us. Mm -hmm. um, you, you know, it's how much energy is going into a twenty-minute versus a series. You know, and what's the payback? So it's kind of a return on investment decision um, nothing to say nothing to do with the creativity and the subject at all it's really just a business decision at that point so it just presents challenges for us okay uh, and there was also a, um, a question about um, documentaries in the international market but I just want to kind of expand that beyond documentaries um, what are your thoughts on the international market for filmmakers based here in the U.S. Um, so Sal, you want to start with that? Uh, we love international and we're expanding um, you know, around the world uh, with our streaming network. So as, and there's a, a little bit of an explosion happening at this point in time with uh, AVOD in particular, IMDb TV, Pluto, Zumos, Tubi's of the world are expanding. So those are downstream monetization opportunities for films that um, generate significant amounts of money now. So that's something that we look at. So it's a little bit more promising, but you know, it's challenging. I think it's important to have a great sales agent for international. There are some that do really great in, for feature films as well. I think the festivals are really important for international to kind of build awareness for an American filmmaker. So, you know, depending on the film, it's either Berlin or, you know, or, or some of the festivals that, that are known for certain things. You want to have a strategy in place for that if you're going to build it. Um, it isn't easy. It takes time. Um, really great movies take a long time sometimes to get distribution um, internationally. So I think it's helpful if you can uh, be with a distributor that might be able to package your movie with a group of other films that's a little bit more appealing. So you can get on Sky TV or some of these other you know networks. Although um, there is a, a great deal of expansion happening now with uh, people like Discovery, uh, going into Latin America, that, that's presenting some new opportunities, I think, for independent films in particular. So we're seeing a little bit more of a, more success in placing films internationally than we had in the past few years. So that's a little spot, bright spot there, but you know, um, but I think it's important to have uh, boots on the ground locally um, to give you a, the flavor of what those distributors are looking for, which, Film rights does have people placed around the world that know the markets. So okay. you can't tell us what's going to work. Yeah. And Gary, do you ever um, rep films that are focused on the international market or is it primarily domestic? I am also a consultant. I sometimes help films find a, a sales agent mm -hmm. if it's not going to be a worldwide sale. Right. Uh, and uh, I think you mentioned docs at one point. So for instance, a couple of good companies for Docs internationally are Dog Wolf. Dog Wolf, yeah. UK. Uh, there's a company called Cinephil that uh, does a decent job with Docs. So you kind of have to know um, yeah. who might be the you know the best player for you know whatever the film is. And they give you great advice. You know, they'll tell you you know if you get in early. You know, there's particularly with documentaries, which are difficult to sell internationally, uh, English. But it's possible that what festivals to maybe go for and uh, give you a strategy for exposure so they can be successful in selling them in. Um, I think for international, uh, biggest request we get is, do you have a dub version? So languages are having those tracks uh, are important. So sometimes we'll, you know, we might make a sale in Canada and get the French dub version and we're able to sell it in France or other, it might open up other markets or Spanish language tracks. Those things all help in packaging and selling internationally. 
Okay. All right. And uh, I just want to conclude with um, Adrian's question, the value in film festivals as it relates to marketability outside of the big festivals, 99.8% of filmmakers will not get into Sundance, right? Or, or similar festivals. So uh, yeah, where do you see the value there? Um, you want to, um, Gary, you want to maybe start? Uh, you should always start big. If you, you always want to try to get into Sundance, Toronto, maybe can, maybe, maybe not, it depends. Uh, if you can't, I'd go to the second level, which is South by Southwest, maybe Tribeca. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not working with those festivals, you kind of have to shift strategies and understand that you're not, your film is not going to make a big, big sale, but mm -hmm. you still want to do something with it. One, one of those strategies would be to work the smaller festivals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. Sal, what about you? Uh, just film uh, I, I agree with that. Um, I, you start big, and uh, and that's the easiest pathway to kind of be noticed and successful, and you'll get reviewed more, more likely that way as well. So yeah. it's important to to try all of those and and really time your time it out properly so you're delivering to them on on the deadlines that you need to. Um, for us, the smaller festivals was to have a lot of value once we picked up a film, but it might have had success in one or two of those that uh, Gary just mentioned, but we might continue the festival run for a few more months just to build up word of mouth and awareness for the picture so that when it finally does get to the streaming platforms, there's some, there's some, uh, there's an audience there waiting, you know, to check it out because uh, they heard about it. So there's some, there's a lot of value to the smaller festivals, I think, once your film is had some, you know, established itself at least with one of those larger festivals or second tier festivals. Right. So it's, it's a, you know, but I agree if it's not connecting, mm -hmm. um, you definitely need to kind of look at your strategy. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have, uh, I just want to, if I could put in the chat box here, just some either a website or some sort of contact information. So like for FilmRise, let's say somebody wanted to submit some work to FilmRise or something. Is there a website they would go to for that? Uh, well, we don't take submissions directly. So we only take submissions through agents okay. um, and so forth. But, you know, feel free. We do have, um, if you just go to FilmRise.com, there are some links there for, to contact us. Okay. Um, you know, uh, but I, I, would, I would highly recommend not sending us it's just going to get tossed back. Um, yep. so it really, you need to work through an agent, a sales agent, or an attorney or someone that, that can present it to us. Yeah. Represent it. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, definitely check out filmrise.com. So at least you get an idea of right. the type of projects that they're putting out, what they're acquiring, and see if it, it would be a good fit for you. You can see platform. all of our latest announcements of what we've been picking up and what, what's currently on streaming, what we're doing with them, what's, you know, promotions and such. The website's actually a good place to go to kind of do your homework. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Josh, if somebody wanted to submit a project, I know we had some questions about people who are interested in Affirm Films. They may have some faith-based projects. Um, how would they get in touch? Yeah, they could, They could. Uh, you know, like Sal, like we, we try to work with uh, established producers, production companies, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the agencies um, out here and reps and all that. But uh, you could take a look at, a, you know, Affirm Films, and, and check out what we've been doing and to see if it, it would make sense. You know, we're, we're sort of in the, we're kind of in the true story business um, mm -hmm. in that like we're looking for um, true stories that, that feel like they could be movies, right? If, if we developed it right. We're not so much looking for those like, like high concept specs or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so that's sort of, you know, that's, that's kind of our space and, and you can kind of, check it out on, on the website, I think. Okay. Oh, is it affirmfilms.com? I, I think so. I, I, I don't think I've been on the website. <laughs> but... I'm pretty sure that's what it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, Google, out, yeah so... Google's a magical place nowadays. You can, you can find yeah. it. You'll find us. We're exactly. around. <laughs> yeah, check out Affirm Films. They're, yeah, they're with, uh, yeah, there you go, affirmfilms.com. They're with Sony Pictures. And, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're a division of Sony. Yeah. Division of Sony. And if you have yeah. a faith-based project, that's what they specialize in. Um, yeah, definitely get in touch. And uh, Gary, if somebody's looking for representation, is there a website or some sort of email or something? Yes, uh, it's a very long and complicated name, which I regret. But if you want to look at the website, just Google Gary Rubin Consulting. It'll pop right up. 
And again, the email is long. So use my Gmail, which is Gary J Rubin at gmail.com. Okay, I'm just going to type it in here. Gary J Rubin at gmail.com. There you go. If anybody's is looking for a sales agent. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, as Sal and, and Josh mentioned, uh, you really need a, represent, a representation to, to a, you know, to, to, to contact these companies and try to pitch your materials. So, you know, you can try emailing Gary and, um, and see where it goes. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you taking the time to be here and uh, sharing this information with all of us and, and uh, hope to see you all soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you.